All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the second annual seminar of the, um, the Politics of International Law seminar series here at the ANU College of Law. I am Dr. Dina Zuvala, and I am um, the convenor of this series. Before I proceed any further, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently in Canberra on the, on the country of the Nawago and Gambri people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and to come. And of course, I would like to acknowledge that sovereignty over this country was never ceded lawfully. Today, um, we are welcoming a very dear uh, colleague, Professor Sujith Xavier, uh, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Windsor. I think it's quite late in the evening in Windsor, so thank you very much, Sujith, um, for bearing with us. For those of you who don't know him, his research covers legal theory, both domestic and international. He's particularly interested in global governance. Third world approaches to international law, public international law, and Canadian international law and its intersections with racialization. He has edited two really important books, and for those of you who haven't read it, that read them, I recommend them, Decolonizing Law, Indigenous, Third World and Settler Perspectives that was published last year by Routledge and Third World Approaches to International Law on Practices and the Intellectual. He's the founding member of the editorial collective of Third World Approaches to International Law Review. And also, and I think quite, that's quite important, his work is also informed by his significant experience working with local grassroots NGOs in Sri Lanka. Um, Sujith will be in conversation with Dr. Kirsten Anley, who is a colleague here at the Australian National University. She is a senior fellow and associate professor at the Corabel School of Asia and Pacific Affairs. Um, Dr. Ainsley um, joined us relatively recently from the LSC, and her research interests lie in the fields of global ethics, where she's interested in the relationship between politics, law, and ethics in international relationships. And in particular, she focuses on the history and development of international criminal law, human rights, and humanitarian interventions. So you can see why she's here in discussion with students today. She's the co-author, along with Chris Brown, of the important understanding international relations. And she co-edited um, Evaluating Transitional Justice, Accountability and peace building in post-conflict Sierra Leone. So the purpose of this seminar series is to bring together people from across institutions, but also from across disciplines, as we're doing today, to discuss the important work of our presenters. Um, and on that note, of course, for you already know that today we will be discussing Professor Xavier's forthcoming piece on locating justice power to AO and the judicial function. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Professor Xavier, who will present us his work roughly for 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, followed by comments and discussion by and with Kirsten. And of course, I'll try to open the floor to our um, attendees to ask questions as well at the end. So thank you, um, Dina. Um, greetings to you uh, from the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Uh, I'm a refugee settler now living on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe uh, peoples. My mother and I fled the conflict in Sri Lanka, and I eventually made my way to the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy with my partner, Tyler. I am honored to be part of this community, and I am very grateful to the Anishinaabe elders and teachers that have patiently taught us what it means to be in good, what it means to be good neighbors and to be in good relations with all the beings that call these lands and waters their home. I continue to learn about my place on these lands and waters. Thank you, Dina, for that warm welcome. It's such a pleasure to be speaking at um, uh, the Australian National University. Um, I remember the few days that I spent on your campus. I think it was in 2015, uh, fondly. Uh, I remember the kangaroos running around, I think somewhere close by. Uh, 
It is also a pleasure to be part of this wonderful series. Um, and I want to thank um, everyone that put in their labor uh, to make this event uh, possible. <clears throat> so in the next 35 to, uh, sorry, in the next 25 to 30 minutes, I want to lay out an argument that I've been working on and thinking about for the past five years. The paper that I will be drawing from is, a forth, is forthcoming in the next issue of the Asian Journal of International Law. It is a project that grew out of some of my earlier academic scholarship on international criminal law. The title of the paper is Locating Justice Pal, Third World Approaches to International Law, International Criminal Tribunals, and Judicial Power. <clears throat> the central argument that I pursue in the paper is the following. Justice Powell's dissent continues to be relevant for international criminal law. An earlier version of the, of the paper is available on my academia.edu page, and the final version should be out by July, hopefully. Uh, please email me if you want a copy. So in the following few minutes, I want to present to you portions of the argument that I deploy in the paper. Uh, let me take a few minutes to first contextualize my interest in international law, international criminal law, and Justice Powell's dissent. Once I've situated the paper in the broader literature and located Justice Powell, I will provide a window into an interesting but often ignored aspect of Justice Powell's dissent, his views on the rules of evidence and procedure. From there, I'll turn to think through why Justice Powell's dissent, uh, characterized as a radical dissent, was largely obscured and ignored. My interest in international criminal law stems from my own lived experience as a survivor of war uh, and a human rights activist in the Eastern province of Sri Lanka during the conflict and now an academic teaching international law and as a lawyer practicing before the various courts in Canada. When I started studying international law, I was hopeful that international criminal law may be able to provide a remedy to the victims of war. As I became more and more familiar with the nature of international criminal law and more broadly public international law, it was impossible to ignore the, the colonial and, and imperial origins of these fields. More importantly, it was impossible to ignore the ongoing racialized hierarchies that are embedded within international law and international criminal law. These concerns about international law are part of a school of thought now known as third world approaches to international law or TWAIL uh, for short. For over the past 30 years, scholars working under the banner of TWAIL have chronicled the colonial and imperial legacies of international law. Scholars have offered significant challenges to international criminal laws, Eurocent Eurocentricity. These scholars have pointed to racial hierarchies embedded within, for example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Scholars like Asad Kiani have pushed to expose the double standards prevalent in the selection of international criminal cases. Similarly, Basuki Naysaya has astutely argued that local voices are used by international criminal institutions to justify their pursuits of international justice. In this paper, I add to the chorus of voices that have offered significant criticism. And in fact, my argument focuses on the everyday practices of international criminal law. <clears throat> Before I get into some of the arguments I set out in the paper, let me say a few words about Justice Powell and the Tokyo Tribunal. General Douglas MacArthur created the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, commonly known as the Tokyo Tribunal, based on the various allies' declarations and the instrument of Japanese surrender. The Tokyo Tribunal's charter and the Tokyo Tribunal's rules were approved and issued by G General MacArthur. These rules were modeled on the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal. These rules set out the jurisdiction and the applicable crimes and other necessary components of Western-based adjudicatory processes. The Gen General MacArthur more or less rubber stamped the appointment of 11 judges from the allied nations, including three judges from, the global, from global South countries. Uh, the countries are India, the Philippines, and China. Two and a half years later, uh, having heard 419 witnesses, witness testimonies and reviewed 4,335 exhibits and 779 witness affidavits, the Tokyo Tribunal rendered its majority decision on the 4th of November, 1948. It was not a unanimous decision. Justice Bernard from France and Justice Powell dissented. Uh, 
Justice Rowling of uh, Netherlands partially dissented. And the president of the tribunal, Justice Webb of Australia, issued a separate opinion. And Justice Jarnilla of the newly independent Commonwealth of the Philippines issued a concurring opinion. Justice Jarnella was in a unique position as he was a victim of the Japanese violence and viewed the prosecution and punishment of Japanese from a drastically different perspective than Justice Powell. <clears throat> Justice Powell is a towering figure in international criminal law. His 1200 page dissent is a significant contribution to the burgeoning field of international criminal law. And I think it continues to be relevant. Of the three full and partial dissenting opinions of the Tokyo Tribunal, Justice Powell's reasons outlined the problem with Western universalism embedded within the majority decision. This led Justice Powell to conclude that the accused must be found not guilty of each and every one of the charges in the indictment and should be acquitted of all of those charges. He viewed the prosecution of the Japanese accused as an act of vindictive retaliation and an exercise in victor's justice. For Justice Powell, the American exemption from uh, prosecution for the atomic bombing of Japan, the general colonial aggression and territorial annexation by the allies rendered any attempts to punish the Japanese as vindictive retaliation. More importantly, he was highly critical of the decision to mandate the tribunal to prosecute undefined and what he termed retroactive crimes. <clears throat> So let me say a few words about the dissent as a means to contextualize um, Powell's uh, views. Dissents play a crucial role in charting the future of legal normativity within specific fields of law in national jurisdictions. There is no universal practice of including dissenting views in international courts and tribunals. And subsequently, there is no consensus on their usefulness. Some international and regional courts allow dissent, while others do not. There is a fantastic history of the politics of dissent reaching as far back as to the debates on creating the permanent International Court of Justice. These debates prompted RPNN to reflect on the necessity of allowing international judges to dissent, given the complex, and here I'm quoting Anand, imprecise, fragmentary, uncertain, and controversial nature of international law. Importantly, he suggested the following, and I've included a, what I thought was a, an important quote from that piece. I won't read the whole thing. Let me just kind of touch on a couple of sentences. Anand suggests that there is no use uh, suppressing uh, these differences. When judges do not agree, it is a sign that they are dealing with subjects on which society itself is divided. It is the democratic way to express uh, dissident views. Within international criminal law, dissents can be viewed for, uh, uh, can be deployed for a variety of purposes. <clears throat> Sometimes described as the paradox of dissent, the politics of dissents of uh, international criminal courts and tribunals oscillate between maintaining the legitimacy of an institution to promoting judicial dialogue. I often think back to my time as clerk to Judge Aegis and the importance of dissents as the appeals chamber of the ICTY and the ICTR decided the fate uh, of, of the respective appeals. Dissents can be straightforward disagreements with the majority view on a specific doctrine. In exceptional circumstances, dissents can take on a fundamental character. Building on these typologies, some dissents within uh, within the international criminal law jurisprudence are radical in nature. Justice Powell's dissent is viewed through this lens. And yet this dissent was largely ignored by both the academic community and the international criminal law bar. <clears throat> now that I've, um, now that I've uh, set out the broader context, let me turn to an often ignored aspect of Justice Powell's dissent his perspective on the rules of evidence and procedure. By looking at this particular aspect of the dissent, I want to signal to Justice Powell's insights about tribunal design and the power of judges to amend and draft the rules of evidence and procedure. <clears throat> These insights could have helped in avoiding some of the significant challenges that the more uh, recent two ad hoc tribunals encountered as they started their work in, in the uh, early 1990s and late 1990s. Justice Powell was 
broadly concerned with the tribunal's double standards in prosecuting the Japanese, while it ignored the colonial violence of the Allies. He was particularly vexed by the lack of prosecution of those responsible for the use of the atomic bombs. <clears throat> to Justice Powell, these double standards then work to fuel a form of victor's justice. A unique aspect of Justice Powell's dissent is the focus on the everyday practices of the tribunal and the rules of evidence and procedure. Justice Powell took issue with the flexibility of the rules and its impact on the daily operation of the tribunal. He chronicled the effects of the judge's powers to draft and amend the rules as, as a means to expedite the uh, daily proceedings. The various procedural irregularities and the determination of truth by a witness testimony. These conceptual challenges then work to reinforce the broader third world systemic critique central to his dissent, double standards and victor's justice. <clears throat> Evidentiary and procedural rules are the backbone of an international criminal tribunal. They are essential in setting out how the institution performs its basic function of determining, the, determining truth and culpability. To that effect, Article 7 of the Tokyo Tribunal Charter was modeled on its Nuremberg counterpart. Article 7 allowed the judges to draft and amend their rules, provided the amendments were consistent with the charter. Based on the Nuremberg precedent, the Tokyo Tribunal Charter, moreover, offered further guidance to the judges on how to conduct the trial, which was laid out in Article 12, and receive evidence, which was laid out in Article 13 and 15. In dealing with the admissibility of evidence, Article 13 enabled the tribunal to move beyond the technical rules of evidence and proclaimed that the tribunal shall adopt and apply to the greatest possible extent expeditious and non-technical procedure and shall admit any evidence which it deems to have probative value. Judges were granted these, what I would call quasi-legislative powers to ensure that the proceedings were expedited. <clears throat> this desire for expeditious trials can be traced back to the drafting of the Nuremberg Charter. The Nuremberg prosecutor, Robert Jackson's meticulous notes on the International Conference on Military Trials from June to August 1945 illustrate the importance of expeditious proceedings. Jackson made the following statement that I've put in the slides uh, when the Allies were drafting the Nuremberg Tribunal's charters. And he says, we do not want technical rules of evidence designed for jury trials to be used in this case to cut down what is really and fairly of probative value. And so we propose to lay down as part of the statute that utmost liberality shall be used. In the paper, I, uh, I, also, find a I also found a couple of interesting quotes from the Russian counterpart who was there uh, during the drafting of the Nuremberg Charter. Uh, but I haven't included it here. Uh, essentially, the Russian general agreed with Robert Jackson. This approach to the rules of evidence and procedure at Nuremberg then traveled to the Tokyo Tribunal via General MacArthur and other American officials tasked with steering the prosecution of the Japanese. There's a rich history about the role of the Americans in drafting the Tokyo Tribunal Charter, which can be saved for another day. <clears throat> The flexibility of these rules precipitated daily procedural irregularities at the Tokyo Tribunal. These procedural irregularities, moreover, can be traced back to the notion of utmost liberality formulated by Robert Jackson. Even Justice Webb, of, or uh, the Australian uh, judge, Justice Webb, commented about the controversial nature of the everyday changes to the rules by the Tokyo bench. In fact, he was very much alive to the effects of these procedural irregularities as evidenced by his comments from the bench. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll take you through a couple of important points. He says, I'm not here to offer any apology on behalf of the tribunal, but as you know, the charter says we are not bound by any technical rules of evidence. All we do on each piece of evidence as it, as it is presented is to say whether or not it has probative value. And the decision on that question may depend on the constitution of the court. Sometimes we have 11 members. Sometimes we've had as low as seven members. And you cannot say, I cannot say that on the question of whether any particular piece of evidence has probative value, you always get the same decision from the seven benches as you would from, the, from 11. That's, I think, a really powerful illustration of the importance of 
the ways in which rules are interpreted or and or applied. <clears throat> The inheritance of Robert Jackson's utmost liberality approach to the rules of evidence and procedure from the Nuremberg Tribunal then had a significant impact on the day-to-day -day operations of the Tokyo Tribunal. This fueled Justice Powell's scathing dissent. In his analysis of the Tokyo Tribunal's rules, Justice Powell was concerned with the ways in which these procedural irregularities had a significant impact on the accused and the proceedings, depending on which judge was present on the bench on a particular day. Let me give you a few examples. On June 26th, 1946, defense counsel sought to cross-examine a prosecution witness on a document that was yet to be introduced into evidence. The judges accepted, uh, <clears throat> the, judges accepted the prosecution's objection. This decision was in accordance with the Tokyo Tribunal rules. Three days later, the tribunal made a similar decision. In this instance, when cross-examining a prosecution witness, defense counsel asked questions based on another yet to be introduced document. The prosecution objected as the document needed to be served 24 hours in advance. The judges accepted this objection. Not, notwithstanding these two rulings, when the prosecution attempted to rely on a yet to be introduced documents or sorry, when the prosecution attempted to rely on yet to be introduced documents in cross-examination, the tribunal departed from its earlier uh, or from its two earlier decisions in June. In fact, the tribunal noted the following. Uh, it says the, the rule as to processing and serving a copy of the document in advance did not apply in this instance. These procedural inconsistencies animated Justice Powell's dissent and his specific focus on the construction of the rules, the application of the procedure, and ultimately their negative impact on the proceedings and the accused. In fact, these types of irregularities where the judges of the tribunal elect to change the rules daily based on what would amount to be an alleged pro-prosecution pro bias then reinforces the themes that, that forms the bedrock of Justice Powell's dissent. These double standards remove the due process rights of the accused and ensure that a form of victor's justice is meted out. <clears throat> justice Powell was concerned um, with the use of uh, hearsay evidence by the Tokyo Tribunal. I'm sorry, I think, uh, I think there's some issues with the uh, with my slides, but anyways, let me just keep going. Uh, Justice Powell was concerned with the use of hearsay evidence by the Tokyo Tribunal. In expressing some of the fundamental flaws of the determination of probative value, Justice Powell was concerned uh, about the prosecution's use of um, Sionji Har Harada's memoir to construct their respective case against the accused. The memoir was in introduced into evidence by the prosecution as part of its rebuttal evidence. The, uh, the memoir reported various conversations with different Japanese officials during the war as experienced and chronicled by the secretary to the prince, uh, Baron Har Harada. These accounts were transcribed by Har 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 Harada's uh, stenographer. Uh, Har Harada dictated the text uh, from 1930 to 1940 based on his interactions with various government personnel. These notes were then re reviewed by uh, Har Harada and later corrected by Prince Sionji. So you can see the way in which this, the, this piece of evidence was given probative value when in fact it's hearsay evidence. In the paper, I chronicle the multiple means by which this notion of utmost liberality traveled to the more recently created ad hoc tribunals and describe examples in which uh, the judges of the two ad hoc tribunals changed the rules of, of procedure and evidence. I document the impact of these quasi-legislative powers of the judges to allow hearsay evidence or to change the rules midway through the hearing. I focus so far on the rationale for Justice Powell's scathing dissent, and to some extent, um, I have I have illustrated the real world implications by gesturing to the impact of ignoring this dissent. And you know, I'm I'm not going into all of the details of how similar issues arose in the context of the Rwandan Tribunal uh, and the Yugoslavian Tribunal. Uh, Nancy Combe has done this wonderful text or has produced a wonderful text called Fact-Finding Without Facts from early uh, 2010, where they lay out 
uh, uh, the use of hearsay evidence before the Rwandan tribunal, for example. And one example that kind of um, sticks out in that context is, um, is the, the reliance uh, on a witness testimony that basically um, attempted to, uh, to uh, kind of chronicle uh, the, the fact that a general who had passed away two years before uh, the actual event was in fact alive. <laughs> And, uh, and so uh, these are some of the challenges that arise in that context. So in light of the foregoing, let me turn to some of my thinking around uh, knowledge production and the privileging of Western knowledge. Here I'm drawing from my own earlier work and the work, and the work of folks like James Gathi and Obi Okafor. Justice Powell's critique of international criminal law has only recently been, uh, has only recently uh, been subject to academic scrutiny. There was a, a return to the Tokyo Tribunal by uh, international criminal law scholars, uh, political scientists, and historians in, uh, in the early 1990s and onwards, where some attention focused on the dissenting views of the judges of the Tokyo Tribunal. Of course, there are a handful of scholars from the Global South that have engaged with Justice Powell. More recently, some have characterized Justice Powell's dissent as deeply suspicious of his utopian state of order. The most interesting examination of his dissents have focused on his third world perspective and animosity towards Western universalism. For example, Adil Khan has characterized Justice Powell as deeply suspicious of universal creeds and truths. Khan states the following, and I've included the quote in the slides. Khan states, Powell demonstrated a tragic ethos in his persistent suspicion of assertions of a universal international community in, in whose name uh, a new truly universal international law was sought to be authorized. <clears throat> While the return to the tribunal's judgment or the Tokyo tribunal's judgment can be viewed as an attempt to recover significant insights from the past, there has yet to be a fulsome reckoning with the arguments set out in Justice Powell's dissent by international criminal law scholars and practitioners. Rather, Powell's dissent has sparked um, <clears throat> varying levels of academic and non-academic dismissal. For example, Justice Powell's scathing assessment of the tribunal was characterized as almost schizophrenic, and here I'm quoting, uh, in 1990. Surprisingly, he was described as the world's first mystic positivist by a leading Western international criminal law scholar. <clears throat> it is true that there are prob problematic aspects within Justice Powell's dissent, and in this vein, some commentary has focused on Justice Powell's unfortunate use of quotes from the white supremacist Jefferson Davies in his conclusion, and I've included the quote in the, uh, in the slides. <clears throat> Others have rightly picked up on Justice Powell's unforgivable and irresponsible, and those are two words from, uh, from uh, two scholars. Uh, others have rightly picked up on Justice Powell's unforgivable and irresponsible dismissal of the severity of the reports of the rape of Nanking and the more general dismissal of Japanese violence and its effects on innocent civilians. <clears throat> As I argue in the paper, the sanest almost schizophrenic and racially charged, quote unquote, mystic references are part of a prevalent trend within international criminal law and other fields of international law. Twelve scholars have pointed to this larger trend endemic within the field of international criminal law, especially in the, in the context of race and wo voice. For example, Victor Catan recently looked at the ICC prosecutor's submission on Palestine. Katan importantly points out that the prosecutor had failed to rely on any Palestinian scholarship vis-a-vis uh, -vis statehood in her submissions to the court. From a different point of view, Obi Okafor identified similar trends in the construction of knowledge in the context of the United Nations Human Rights Commission, where expertise travels in a single direction from the north to the south, causing a, and here I'm quoting from Okafor's piece, a one-way traffic paradigm. Okafor's reflection is particularly salient and helps to rationalize why Justice Powell's dissent was not studied while Justice Rowling's was. Race and subject position of the judges matter. 
these are not unique features to international criminal law. Rather, they're a part of a, of a larger form of what I would call false Western universalism that perpetuate what Anthony Engie has characterized as the dynamic of difference. The construction of, of Justice Powell as mentally ill or someone of the occult, coupled with his own promotion of prominent white supremacists like Jefferson Davies, and the negation of the lived experiences of the victims of the Japanese, then worked to dispossess his radical claims set up in the dissent. Justice Powell's pro-Japanese sympathies and his overt support of these movements during the post-war period did not help either. There's a wonderful chapter by Prabhakar Singh or Dean Prabhakar Singh now on how the Indian government sought to disinherit Justice Powell given his radical views. By, disin by disinheriting Justice Powell, his dissent was not able to gain any traction to become part of the larger critique of the universalism of international criminal law. Let me stop there and say thank you for listening and hopefully we can have a chat. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Xavier. And I think I will not say anything for now. I'll just pass on the floor uh, to Dr. Ainley for comments and questions. Thanks very much, Tina, and thank you so much, um, Sujith. I'm typing furiously. I read the paper in um, some detail before you spoke, but there's just so many ideas that you're bringing to the fore. I wanted to start um, by thanking you for a really beautiful acknowledgement to the Three Fires Confederacy. I'm also an immigrant settler, this time to Australia, and living and thinking with the tension of researching ethics and law from a settler colony, so I really appreciated um, that beautiful acknowledgement. So it's a privilege to be asked to participate today. Thank you very much, Tina, for asking me. Um, and Sidhu, thank you for the, so many ideas to raise to discuss. I think it's critical to remember the history of contemporary practices and to challenge the dominance of Western voices, the story we so often hear about in The Hague, this kind of heroic story which forgets Tokyo entirely and certainly wouldn't engage with PAL. I think it's particularly critical to be thinking about international prosecutions of what's been become known as the crime of aggression at a time when the Twitterverse is getting very excited about the possibility of prosecuting it again. So um, this piece of history has um, has significant contemporary relevance here. So my interests are in the politics and ethics of international law. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert on the Tokyo trials or on Justice Powell. So my questions are more general. And the first one is probably the most difficult, but I'm going to use the opportunity to ask you because it's something that troubles me a lot um, in the work that I do. I want to ask you to, if you're willing to unpack the tension between rescuing and dismantling international criminal law or international law um, in a bit more detail, you talk a little bit in the introduction to the paper and a little bit in the conclusion at the paper that we have to recognize now the, the arguments towards abolition. But in the close interrogation of procedure, um, there's an implication, I think, that procedure can be improved. You also said something very interesting about you are, you are uncertain that victims of mass violence can seek redress through some form of international criminal justice beyond the reach of the ICC, suggesting that maybe the ICC might have improved things. I think you do suggest it has in terms of the rules of procedure and evidence. And, and I'm with you in that I spend a lot of time thinking about the practices of, of international courts and the um, needs and demands of victims for some form of accountability, sometimes phrased as a demand for international criminal proceedings, sometimes not. Um, but what if all of these trials are fundamentally and inherently political with a prosecution bias? I mean, you can make those arguments. Those arguments have been very persuasively made about the ICC as well, certainly hugely biased towards African perpetrators and African victims in its first 15 years, hamstrung by budget constraints from states and the Assembly of State Parties gives a budget to the ICC, which means it can investigate only very few numbers of cases every year. So it's, it is also selective due to the economics of the court and possibly also due to the practices within the office of the prosecutor. So I wanted to, to ask you to unpack a little bit or to, uh, to share with us some of your thinking about that tension between rescuing and dismantling. And then linked to that, given your expertise on 12 scholarship, I'm interested in whether you think the commitment to the reconstruction of an emancipatory international law is still central to 12 scholarship or whether there is a movement towards 
abolition or whether the, yeah I guess where, where are we likely to see the moves in this scholarship in the next five or ten years is that of course there's a slight unease in claiming Pal as part of the Twelve tradition because while he's certainly radical his opposition to a universal legal system or universal legal criminal system suggests he'd be firmly on the side of abolition but perhaps not for the reasons that some abolitionists would support which takes me on to the the second point which you came to at the end of the presentation is how important is the man versus the argument when we're looking at the history of the development of international law um, and you, you explore some of this uh, in the paper you acknowledge these the use of slaver quotes um, the views of power and, and and kind of bracket them so that we need to acknowledge them but here's the substance of the critique and that stands separate to the the politics the political commitments and the ethical commitments um, of the judge himself and i wondered how far that argument could be pushed whether if we acknowledge that at least part of the operation of international law is political we need to recognize the political purpose of the dissent and powell was taking a position to some extent on or influenced by indian nationalism um, his sympathy for Japan is more than just um, a, a kind of bracket, an unfortunate feature. Um, it's surely also at least partially a driver of his argument. So I know what you're not doing in the paper is trying to assess or defend his argument. You're placing it as part of a radical tradition, which has something very important to tell us now, particularly about uh, rules of procedure and evidence. Um, but I wonder quite how, uh, quite how, um, bracket whether let me put it slightly differently i wonder if we acknowledge the politics of international law whether we should more centrally acknowledge the politics of these kinds of dissents not to undermine them but to more fully understand them in their role so that there is probably a difference between quoting a slaver and having a sympathy for um uh, sovereignty um, and for japan um but can we undermine a dissent by fully acknowledging this and still seeing the benefits uh, in a legal argument so let me make if i can Dina, two more points. Um, one on the rules of procedure and evidence. You can always just mute me, Dina, at some point. If you need to. <laughs> no intention of so doing. <laughs> so one is on rules of procedure and evidence, which is so important in trials. So I've done some work on hybrid tribunals. Um, and they're very rarely, the rules are very rarely really taken seriously. And yet they determine enormous amounts of the practice of trials and quite feasibly the outcome of trials. So I guess the key question here is twofold. One is um, who might be better than judges to decide on the rules? So is an assembly of state parties any better? Uh, I know, for instance, Special Tribunal for Lebanon, Kisesi, who was president of the tribunal, issued a memorandum uh, where he talked about what he thought the tensions might be that came up under the rules and how they might be resolved. So it was very open, but quite, quite kind of president heavy. The Kosovo Specialist Chambers, the RPE, went through lots of rounds with different parties, including up to the Supreme Court of Kosovo before being adopted. So is there, again, this gets back to the question of, is this a practice that we're trying to rescue or in the process of, of dismantling? Are there, um, are there better agents than judges to decide on what the rules should be? And then is, is international criminal practice any worse than domestic practice here? Um, so, are RPE likely to be more stable in most systems? So where you see procedural appeals, they're not because the, the procedure itself has been changed mid-trial, but because there have been procedural failures. And I, it's a, an open question. I don't know this, whether international practice is worse than domestic practice. Um, and then I think finally, just one other thing is, is on this issue, the, whether coloniality is the best explanation for what you see, particularly on RPE. So are the pressures of finishing expeditiously um, of getting out, particularly the ICTY and the ICTR that you talk about in some detail uh, in the piece. These pressures to actually wrap up these tribunals. Is coloniality the best explanation for that? It's the best explanation for a lot of what you see in the, both the establishment of the trials and, the, um, uh, and, and some of the practices of the trials in terms of what's charged and who's charged and the double standards. But I wondered in the RPE whether we're still seeing um, colonial thinking and I guess and this is the point I'll end on I was somewhat I'm still playing with the Coombs piece that um, that Rwandan uh, traditions of not being able to specify time and place in a way which is acceptable under a kind of colonial legal practice 
that for Coombs undermines the value of the verdicts, and of course for a number of defence lawyers undermines the value of the verdicts, but that in is itself kind of arguing for colonial standards to be upheld, for us to do better if we can't find people who can uh, give evidence according to standards that would be acceptable under colonial practices, then that, those convictions are unsafe. So I guess it gets back to, I mean, maybe it's that the, the only way this system works, the international criminal system works, is to sit on colonial practices. So is this an argument to dismantle it totally? Circling right back to the beginning, but I'll leave it there. And thank you so much for the opportunity to read and to engage. Thank you. And just to say how grateful I am for this very, very close reading that you offered, Kirsten. I thought it was wonderful. I'll give the, I'll give the floor to Sujit. Um, Dina, how long do I have to respond? We haven't gotten any questions yet. So as long as you want, until okay. any question comes <laughs> in from the audience, I'll interrupt you. Okay. All right. So let me, I guess, let me jump around a little bit and try to figure out um, um, how to uh, kind of respond meaningfully. Um, Kristen, thank you so much for those, uh, that deep engagement. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, often people or uh, scholars are told that the only time someone will engage with your work is when you defend your PhD uh, closely. Uh, so thank you for this close reading uh, of the work. Um, and you're right to kind of get to the rescue and dismantling piece. And it's something that I've been struggling with, right? Um, and so for me, you know, and, and this is why I want to kind of foreground my encounter with international law at the outset, because in the beginning, I came to international law as a space to find a remedy, right, for the loss of loved ones and, you know, all of that stuff, right? And so, so in that sense, you know, there is that, there is that, attempts to kind of think through how can we provide the best remedy for the victims? And here, I guess this is the rescue part. But then now, as I kind of make my way through the law or as I've made my way through the law, the dismantling piece, I think, is becoming more and more important for me. And I think as I engage more and more with uh, indigenous scholars and as I reflect more on my own place uh, here, I'm coming to the realization that maybe this is the time to kind of burn it all down. I think there was this wonderful panel that Kamari Clark organized uh, in, in the context of anthropology with a number of colleagues, uh, uh, burn, uh, uh, let anthro burn, right? And I think for me, in some sense, that's, there is a, a real kind of desire to move to that to that space and but then you know i often come back to the fact that you know when i'm when i've worked as a lawyer or when i've uh when i've gone back to sri lanka and i encounter uh folks right uh who could be my grandmother who could be my cousin etc who turn to me and say you know the sri lankan courts are terrible that we must go to the international criminal court because we want justice for my son Right. And so, you know, and I'm stuck in, in this space, right, of like, I, we have to kind of get people some form of remedy. And I'm thinking about the mothers of the disappeared who have been sitting and protesting because they can't find their loved ones. And, you know, we have to kind of figure out how to give them the, the response. And Rajapaksa in the context of Sri Lanka has said, yeah, 20,000 people died. So what? Right. And so here in that context, then it's, you know, it's trying to figure out what do we do. And for me, one of the things has often been and here, let me kind of fall back on twail, you know, it's to, to kind of respect the lived experiences of the, of uh, the people of the global south and to some extent then if if it is justice that they seek in these adjudicatory processes maybe that is what we give them and then we try to kind of tinker with the system right which then leads me to you know and I know that's not a, a robust answer and I'm still trying to figure it out myself because I'm still trying to think through the ways in which we can kind of uh, formulate some sort of response, especially, you know, and I'm working on some new stuff or new, new work right now on reconciliation. And this is something that I'm kind of grappling with. So the short answer to your question is I'm not sure yet. <laughs> uh, but, but then that leads me to then your question around, let me just jump to your last question, which was 
uh, around our RP uh, uh, rules of evidence and procedure more stable in the domestic? And uh, are we reinscribing, uh, or my argument doesn't really play out that well in the context of rules of evidence and procedure in, in terms of the global South perspective or the 12 perspective. And on the first question, are rules more stable in the domestic or are they all unstable? I would argue that in the, in the common law jurisdictions that I've practiced in, the rules are much more stable than they are in the in the international criminal law space. And as I pointed out in the in the piece, you know, you have this one example of the judges deciding to change the way in which a witness testimony is received. Right? That's unheard of. <laughs> I, like, I, when I read that decision, I was thinking, wait, so you had three judges, one was sick, and so you decide to proceed with two, but the three judges have to make a decision about the, about the person's kind of guilt at the end without hearing from the, from the, the, the witness. How is, that, the, how is that possible? And, you know, I was chatting with a couple of my civil law colleagues, and they were like, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, they could have read the, the materials. It's no big deal. And for me, I just, oh, <laughs> that is, uh, you know, unfairness. You know, I'm teaching administrative law right now. And, you know, thinking about the fair process is really, really important for us, right? And, and then, of course, the rule of law arguments, et cetera. And so in the criminal law or in the international criminal law context, I find that the, the discussions around the rules or the ways in which the rules were changed and I, you know, I worked for Judge Aegis, who was the chairman of the quote unquote, the rules committee once it was formulated. And he was quite, he did not tell his clerks or you know, any, of, any of us what happened in the rules committee because they were very kind of, they were quite keen to keep confidentiality. And so the ways in which they changed the rules seemed ad hoc, right? And, and there was no discussion in that context. So for me, I think, you know, the rules are, uh, much more stable in the domestic context, if it, in particular the, the common law jurisdictions. But then, you know, I guess I've only practiced in Canada, so I can't make a large, you know, broad sweeping claim about uh, common law jurisdictions across the world. Now, coming back to the to the the issues on colon coloniality and the rules, I think the double standard argument gets played out even more in the context of the rules to some extent, because if we if we go to the ways in which hearsay evidence was admitted in Rwanda or uh, the ways in which the rules were changed in Yugoslavia, the haphazard nature in which all of this happened, I think points to the fact that Rwanda was never meant to have a tribunal. They, the Security Council set it up because they were worried about the, uh, the double standards arguments. Right? Oh, you set up one for Yugoslavia, you didn't set up one for Rwanda. Right? And so I think you know, th that framing or that, that double standards arguments gets, uh, it's very embedded. And I guess it goes back to the, the utmost liberality approach that I kind of alluded to or that I spoke about in terms of Robert Jackson's uh, uh, role in Nuremberg. Um, but thank you for all of the wonderful questions. Uh, and maybe if we have time, I want to come back to your 12 question about reconstruction versus abolition, because I think that's really important. But maybe I'll stop there, Dina, for now. Thank you very much. I think that was an excellent answer. And I think, yeah, it raises so many more questions that I have. I'll ask one of the questions that have come to me in the chat, which is by Nat Piper, who can't actually switch on their microphone and talk. Um, and they raise the issue of restorative justice as a novel concept in the United States. How or whether does this approach look like at all in international law, and if it has been used by any countries, and I will editorialize and I will ask you what do you think are also the prospects of ever being used like do you think that would be a way or way of doing justice in international law so I you know my my understanding of restorative justice is quite limited so I won't try to kind of get into uh, a lot of the details but in terms of how I understand it from the Canadian context and in, in terms of how it's played out in the Canadian context, it has been to provide some form of compensation and also to kind of improve the livelihoods of the victims, 
right? And and so you know, uh, and Kirsten, this might be more your uh, your area of expertise, or this might fall in the in that line of thinking a little bit more. But uh, you know, for me, one of the ways in which this has played out in the Canadian context is to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, the 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 uh, I guess the the approach adopted in that context. And then the compensations and you know all of that stuff that has been meted out. And to be honest, I think you know if I was to look at the Canadian example as an example of restorative justice, the the victims were given ten thousand dollars each. The victims of residential schools were allocated ten thousand dollars each, for uh, depending on the severity of the of what had happened to them, right? Those who who in, who experienced sexual violence. Um, received a little bit more and uh, so so in the in, you know in the grand scheme of things the monetary value that's been ascribed has been quite limited right because the state has hasn't provided them too much and so in that context I think you know um, I'm I, I have a chapter in right now uh, that's under review on quote unquote transitional justice uh, it, from uh, thinking about transitional justice from a TWAIL perspective. And many of the TWAIL scholars that have kind of thought through this issue of, you know, or this aspect of compensation, for example, in the context of restorative justice, and it's just one, one element of it, I guess, um, have found it to be quite lacking, right? And so, um, but I, I, let me just leave it there. I don't know, Kristen, if you wanted to jump in and add something to that question. If I may, I'd just say something <clears throat> quite briefly. I mean, first, yes, that all of the discussion of reparation, I think, is super relevant. And when you look back at something like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, there was eventually reparation for victims through a separate system, which uh, I think victims, the, the victims of the worst violence got something like $1,000, and the court itself cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's an enormous imbalance between what's invested in and a real discomfort still, I think, at the international criminal law level of taking being the victim of economic crime seriously. So of taking seriously that you might lose your home or your livestock um, or vehicles or things that are of, um, of significant material importance to you in war. It's almost that that's victims who are victims of um, violations of bodily integrity are the um, the sort of master victims within the practice, but there's the devastation caused by conflict so fundamentally material and there are so many material needs of those who have been victims of conflict, but I think international criminal law is lagging behind, but there is this movement towards reparation and some interesting work being done, but the trust fund for victims at the international criminal court is reasonably um, far sighted here in trying to um, to institute a reparation provision, but I think some of the what, something that I've been looking at recently is the move from restorative to transformative justice, which is a discussion within um, in, within the kind of transitional justice literature that leaves criminal justice behind. I'm sorry, I've got a message that says my internet connection is unstable, but it, but it links very much to work that's being done um, by activists in the US around social justice uh, and racial justice. And I think there's lots of really fruitful discussion that can be had there of the ideas of transformation. Thank you, that was great. It's 12.59, but if you don't mind going slightly over time, I will ask one more question that I have in the chat um, by Dr. Catherine Grimman, which is, she's wondering if this liberality of you know, using evidence or the liberality of approaching evidence is also linked to a broader ideology of international criminal law, which we see until today, where acquittals are treated as a disaster, right? That being acquitted is treated as a disaster for the project of international criminal justice. But at the same time, also, it is notable that the ICJ also has very liberal uh, evidentiary rules, right? Where we are dealing with state against state rather than individuals. And she's asking whether it would be interesting to analyze the SCJ also practice from a um, TWAIL perspective. There is, but the SCJ doesn't have rules of evidence, basically, right? If we wanted to put it <laughs> not in a fine point. So Suj, if you want to. Uh, sure, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Atta Hens and Ralph Wiles attempts to make submissions, I think before the ICJ recently on, I, I can't remember which case it was, it had, probably had something to do with Palestine, but they were barred from making uh, 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 making submissions because they had missed the time limits, 
right? So there are procedural rules in the in the context of time limits with the ICJ, right? And so there there are uh, so it, there are certain types of rules uh, in terms of. Uh, which ties to evidentiary rules, I guess. So time limits, you know, all of that stuff in terms of the submissions, uh, the length of submissions. So there are those kinds of rules. But then, uh, but then, I, yeah, I, Dina, you probably know more about this than I do. But I, I haven't really looked at the kind of the uh, the other rule, the evidentiary rules before the ICC. But on the on the issue of acquittals, I think. Catherine, you're absolutely right that there is this kind of liberal approach that's taken and uh, to thinking through uh, acquittals and uh, which is similar to the rules of evidence and procedure. And I, I think ultimately this is about, uh, you know, a pro-conviction bias, right? And we have to kind of fall back on that because ultimately, you know, if we really think about the Rwandan tribunal or the Yugoslavian tribunal, we all know who did, who were the perpetrators, right? In terms of Rwanda, it, you know, the Hutu folks who were engaged in the, in the violence were known to their uh, neighbors, the Tutsi uh, neighbors. And to some ex extent, it's the similar story in the context of uh, uh, Yugoslavia. I remember, you know, when I was, working for ages, it, there were a number of testimonies that kind of struck me where uh, the perpetrators were known to the victims because they had interacted with them as children, et cetera, right? And so in that sense, because we know who the perpetrators are, there is this pro-conviction bias that's embedded in the, in, in the prosecution itself from the beginning. And in some sense, this comes back to kind of the earlier discussions around show trials, et cetera, right? And so, so I think that's probably why, in some sense, the acquittals are seen as disasters. Because how can you be acquitted when we know that you were supposed to be punished? Because we know you did it, right? And so, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm too embedded in the in the common law ways of thinking about things, and maybe I'm too embedded in the practice of law. But for me, in the the criminal threshold is quite high, right? Beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I don't know, maybe, and then this comes back to Kristen's, uh, Kristen's um, comments around being so uh, wedded to the, the prosecution and the ways in which prosecution should operate and the coloniality of all of that. Maybe, you know, if I was to kind of go back to Fanon, maybe I need to kind of <laughs> remove myself from these ways of thinking and, you know, maybe, you know, not to kind of be, uh, flippant about it about this but decolonize my mind in some sense right but at the same time i'm just kind of struck by the fact that look this is criminal law you're taking someone's freedom away right and so in that context i i, I don't know I, I maybe i find it quite uh, challenging to accept the fact that it could be so liberal you know Absolutely. I think we, some enthusiastic nodding from me, I think we agree. We are four minutes past the hour. You have both been tremendously generous with your time and with your intellectual work. So I just want to thank you both, Kirsten and Sujay, for your time and for your generosity and for your ideas. And of course, to thank all our attendees for being here. And I think I will bring uh, the procedure to a close. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, Sujay. Have a good afternoon to everyone joining from Australia. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.